Good morning, Horizon Church. We are so glad you're here for worship this morning. I wanted to start by reading a few verses from Psalm 84. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. And I love, especially during this season with COVID and quarantines and people being separated, we have our strength in the Lord and that cannot change. And, and we also pass through valleys. And right now, this is a valley that we're in. However, it says it makes it a place of spring. And so there's new life and renewal that even comes out of the valley. And so we get to be a part of that right now in this season. I pray for you that you're continuing to, to see God as redeeming something in, in your life and, and causing you to see his vision, his kingdom vision, even in a time where it seems like a valley and things seem um, like they continue to get worse in some ways, but God still remains uh, our hope and our strength. And we can even grow a lot during this time. So before we get to, to worship and the teaching this morning, I wanted to share a little bit of information about groups and gathering and really some new things coming up as maybe some things are opening up a little bit more, hopefully over the next few weeks. Uh, we do have a, a women's Bible study on Tuesdays at 630 and that's continuing over here. But we're starting a Monday Spanish women's Bible study at 6 p.m. And so if you know anyone that would want to come here and grow and, and build community, it's a women's Bible study in Spanish Monday at 6 p.m. And for the men, uh, we're actually trying to start one pretty soon. And so what we're trying to do is develop interest and receive feedback from some men that would want to start meeting weekly um, pretty soon. So if you can connect with us via email or on the website, let us know if you'd like to join a group and join a community and we can help find a different day to meet so that we can keep on growing together. Of course, Wednesday, we have our prayer at noon and you're welcome to come. We can have up to 30 people right now uh, for, for prayer. And uh, it's a really a great time to, to grow and engage the Lord and, and really to, to pray with everybody and pray about what's going on and to praise God too for all the things that he's doing right now. If you haven't gotten our survey in the e-news, we're trying to, to really get some more information on where you're at and where the community's at as far as gathering again as a church. And so uh, make sure you've signed up for the e-news so you can get that survey. I think we've already had about 75 or 80 people sign up for it. But we need to know how comfortable you are, how, how safe you feel with coming back. And we want to come back with wisdom and with patience and with safety during this time uh, because our communities matter greatly and we know that many of you are meeting in small groups and, and home groups, but we would love to hear how you feel with, with coming back gradually, not rushing it, but still uh, having a place on Sundays and maybe even a Saturday time of worship for us all to grow together again. So we'd love to hear your feedback on that. And of course the website uh, we, we ask that you continue to give. Daniel recently talked about generosity and that you pray about that, that you would give, continue tithing uh, as much as you can, as much as you feel led during this time. So let me pray before we get started. Lord, we thank you for another morning. We thank you for new mercies this morning. And we thank you for this for this psalm we see in Psalm 84 that your people pass through the valleys, they pass through the hard times, but you even provide uh, a spring in those times. You provide new life in any time, in any season that we go through. And so may we continue to see the redemption in any part. May we continue to praise even when there is maybe suffering around us or maybe even in us. And we pray that you would give us more and more of a community to grow with, to get to know, uh, to be challenged by, and to be shaped uh, really by your word and community and by these disciplines that we're continuing to learn. So may we set aside uh, any other anxieties or burdens and just give that to the Lord this morning. And may we grow in you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey everyone, I'm so glad that you could join us here online today. We're continuing in a series called Abide, a study on spiritual disciplines. And I remember when we started this series all the way back in the beginning of June, um, I just had this hesitation about doing this series. And not because I didn't think we needed it as a church, because I knew that God had burdened my heart uh, to be teaching through these spiritual disciplines. But my hesitation was that I just felt ill-prepared. I, I felt like I needed to take maybe six months. And I even confessed this to my wife. I said, I, I just feel like I should take maybe six months and, and just master these things before I set out to teach these things. And, and now I realize that, first of all, six months would not be enough time. And then second of all, I may not ever master these things. And, and I don't think that should be our goal. I don't think that's what that what God even is like desiring of you to master all of these disciplines, but simply to practice these things that we're talking about. I told you a few weeks ago that my youngest son, Micah, that he's, pla he's played like four instruments and he'll take lessons for a month or so. And then he'll, he'll stop and he'll say, you know, I'm just not any good at it. I don't want to do it because I'm no good at it. And I think sometimes we can carry that same attitude into something that's hard like these spiritual disciplines, where we try to get into rhythm and we try to get good at it and we find that after a few weeks, we're just not there. It's still frustrating. We still can't get into a, a, a daily rhythm. And so we just kind of abandon and we give up on them. And I wanna encourage you not to do that. I wanna encourage you to, to, to hang in there, to keep, practicing these things that we're looking at. Keep trying, keep doing your best. And today we are looking at the spiritual discipline of fasting. And I think that fasting is probably the most misunderstood of all the, the spiritual disciplines. It's probably the most ignored of all the spiritual disciplines. And I would say even the most feared of all spiritual disciplines. And matter of fact, there's probably somebody watching today that's afraid, I'm about to tell you that you can't drink coffee this week. And I'm not gonna say that, all right? But I will say this, that if, the, if for you, the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup, then you might need to consider a fast from, from coffee. But uh, Donald Whitney, he wrote a great book on spiritual disciplines. It's called Spiritual Dis uh, Disciplines for the Christian Life. And um, if you have any interest in growing in spiritual disciplines and learning more about spiritual disciplines, I highly recommend that book by Donald Whitney, uh, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. But he said this about fasting. He said, Christian fasting is a believer's voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. Another author, Tim Chalice, uh, defined fasting in this way. He says, fasting, um, in fasting, you are withholding from yourself something that you need, which is food, in order to pursue something that you need even more, which is God. And so today I want to give you three truths about fasting. The first truth about fasting is that fasting is something that you should be practicing. Okay, it's something that you should be practicing. You know, sometimes there's things that we see in the Bible and oftentimes they're in the Old Testament and we'll say, well, that's not for today. That those principles or those ideas, those teachings, they're not really relevant uh, for us today. They weren't written with us in mind. Or maybe we even say, that's the old covenant. We're not under the old law anymore. And so we kind of explain away these things and we say that's not for today. And you know, it's, it's interesting because usually we only say that about things that we don't wanna do. Like we never say that about principles like take a day of rest, you know, or a workman is worth his wages. You know, of course, those are still applicable for today, but the things that we maybe don't agree with or we don't wanna do, we try to say it's not for today, but you're going to see that fasting is something that's still relevant for us today. I think it's something that, that God still desires for us 
today. There is still a purpose and, and it still has value for us today. And we see fasting all throughout the Old Testament commanded. You see um, individuals fasting. You see nations even called to fasting. And then, of course, into the New Testament with John the Baptist and then Jesus himself modeled fasting and, and of course, uh, the disciples. And one of those uh, times where we see Jesus calling us to fast is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. And Jesus doesn't say, if you feel like it, then do it. Or he doesn't say, if you think that you can gain value from it, then do it. No, Jesus says in that verse, when you fast, he's calling us to Christian fasting. Now, there is all kinds of different fasting that we see in scripture. There's fasting, which is the abstinence from food, uh, where you're just drinking water. There's partial fasting, which you see where people, maybe they're just eating fruits and vegetables and they're not eating anything else, or they're just eating bread and water and they're not eating anything else. And then there's absolute fast, where they're literally eating nothing. They're eating nothing and they're drinking nothing. Now, obviously a fast like that doesn't last very many days. And then you see a personal fast where it's just one person and God. You see a family fast where the family has agreed for this season to fast. You see um, a communal fast where a whole community is called to fasting. You see a congregational fast where a whole church, a whole body is called to fast, and even national fasting where a whole nation is called to, to abstain from food for the purpose of seeking God. You see regular fasting where it's, it's on a regular basis, and you see occasional fasting where they're just, every once in a while, they feel called or led to it, they're fasting. But in all of these different kinds of fast, it always includes abstaining from food. Now, we need to understand that 2,000 years ago, in these times where this was written, that food preparation was a long ordeal. That, you know, in order for someone to prepare a meal, it took quite a bit of their day. This was before running water, before refrigeration, before supermarkets, or any of the, the, the ease that comes with food prep today. And, um, and so everything that you were gonna use for your meal had to be gathered. Everything had to be um, made from scratch. And so it literally could take half a day just to prepare a meal. And if it included beef, that's gonna be even a, a longer process. You had to go out into the field and find a cow. You had to uh, kill that cow, butcher that cow. All of this work before you're even seasoning and cooking and preparing it. And so when someone committed to fasting in that time, it freed up quite a bit of their time. It freed up quite a bit of their day. Today, when we think about fasting, a lot of times we're only thinking about that 15 or 30 minutes that we're gonna gain when we typically would um, prepare our meal and then eat it. It, it, sometimes our food, our meal prep can be really quick. And so we're not thinking about the long, how long of a process uh, food prep was then and how long or how much time they're really gaining. And so sometimes because of that, I think there's people that say, well, I'm going to uh, fast from something that gives a little bit more of my, my time, that, something that consumes more of my day, or I'm going to give of something that uh, is a little bit more of a sacrifice to me than just giving up, you know, a 15, 30 minute time where I would typically be eating. And, and so they say, I'll give up social media or I'll give up my phone for the day or technology for the day, or maybe Netflix for a week or something like that. And, and I think there's a place for that materialistic kind of, of fasting. I think that you can really um, gain from that. But biblical fasting in the truest sense of, of the word is always, always involves food. It's always an abstaining 
from something that you need. Now, I was talking to some of our staff this week, and they argued that some people have gotten into a place in life where they need their phone, or they need some of the social media or some of these things that we have come so accustomed to using. But truly, the thing that we need is food. And so it's this laying down this thing that our body, that, that our, we need in life in order to pursue a greater need, and that is God. And so now, obviously, if you have health issues, if, if um, you have diabetes or low b- blood pressure, then you're going to be a little more cautious. That you, you can't just say, I'm going to start out on a three-day fast and, and not eat anything for three days. I don't, that, would not be, we, that would not be wise. You need to think about more like a partial fast or maybe from fasting from something else. But what I don't want you to do is just write off the whole idea of fasting because I think fasting is something that should be practiced. In my studies this week, I, I realized as I was looking at different resources that it is really hard to find resources about fasting written between the years of 1880 and 1955. There's like a 75 year gap where it's, you just don't see this, this principle of fasting being written about or even really taught too much by people of that era. It's like the evangelical church kind of lost this principle of fasting during that time. And it's, it's interesting because when you think about what, what was happening during that time period, you have the Great Depression, you have uh, multiple world wars, you have some really uh, life-changing, world-changing events taking place. At the same time, you have this group of people that are, are not praying and fasting, or at least they're not uh, writing about it and and pushing it forward in the church. And because of that, when you take two two generations and you kind of skip a teaching in the church, then it shows. Because I know um, the church I grew up in, I never heard this principle taught. I, I don't remember my grandparents or even my parents really talking about this principle. It didn't seem to be something that was really valued or, or taught as something that was pr- uh, practical or applicable for us today. And and so because of that, I had in my mind this idea that that fasting was something that they did years ago in the Bible. And I had in my mind that fasting maybe was something that that Catholics did around Easter time when when they didn't eat chocolate or something small like that. But what I want us to see, whether we were taught this, whether the church has been teaching this, whether we've lost this um, teaching, I want us to see that the Bible tells us clearly that fasting is something that should be practiced. The second truth is that fasting is something that should be purposeful, that it should have a purpose. And really two things when it comes to purpose, I think are important. One is that we have integrity. There's a passage in Matthew chapter Six. If you have your Bible, you can flip with me there to Matthew chapter 6. In verses 16 through 18, it addresses fasting and it says, when you fast, all right, not if you fast or if you think you could benefit from it, but when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites and And do not disfigure your face and show men that you are fasting. I tell you the truth, you have received your reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it is not obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is being done in secret will reward you. And so he's telling us to not be showful in our fast, to not just walk around and tell everybody that we're fasting. And and, um, just that idea that that fasting isn't so that we look more spiritual. Matter of fact, fasting shouldn't have anything to do 
with looks or appearance. Sometimes people will fast maybe to lose weight or to look better, to be healthier. And, and, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to that in a second, but it shouldn't have anything to do with how we look. It should have more to do with what, how we're being. Instead of looking more spiritual, we need to fast to be more spiritual. And so we need to have integrity. We need to make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. And that's the second part is not just integrity, but we need to be intentional with our fasting. It's not one of those things where you get halfway through the day and you realize, wow, I forgot to eat uh, lunch today. I guess I'll just call this a fast day. And uh, no, there should be intentionality. You should be planning and purposeful as you get ready to fast. It should be planned. Isaiah 58 um, is a passage that also speaks to fasting. If you have your Bible, flip over with me to Isaiah chapter 58. And here's this group of people, the Israelites, and they are going through the motions. They're fasting. They're worshiping God. But in their there's no authenticity there. There's no integrity there. They're really just going through the motions and, and they're, they're fasting, they're praying, they're worshiping God, but yet they're also living in rebellion. They're, they're not living in obedience to God. Matter of fact, the chapter before 58 in chapter 57, we're told that they were uh, rebelling against God, that they were actually... Um, burning with lust, that they were living in sin and that they were worshiping false gods. But then they're, they're going to come to God. We see it in chapter 58, where they, they come before God and they say, we're, look what we're giving up. We're, we're giving up food and we are, we're fasting. But yet God calls them to something more. He's not interested in them giving up food. He's more interested in them first giving up sin, for them to fast for the purpose, first of all, of repentance and of confession. And so in verse 58, he, or chapter 58, verses one through five, it says, shout aloud and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sin. For day after day, they seek me out and they seem eager, eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of God. They ask me for just decisions. They seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and, and you've not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you've not noticed yet in the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You're exploiting all of your workers. Your fast ends with quarreling and strife and striking each other with your wicked fist. He says, you cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. This is the kind of fast that I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself. Or is this the kind of fast I've chosen? That's what he communicates to them. This is not acceptable to the Lord. And so they're fasting. They're, with, they're, they're withstanding from, from food, but not for the right purposes, not for the right reasons. And then he tells us some of the right reasons in, verse six, in verses 6 through 12. And I, I'm going to go through these really quick. But he says in verse 6, is not this kind of fasting what I've chosen, to loosen the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. He says in that verse that the purpose of fast is to break a sinful pattern. Something maybe that, that you've been caught in, a habitual sin, an ongoing thing in your life. He says fasting is a thing that can break that sinful pattern. Verse seven, he says, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor and wandering with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? 
Here he gives even more purpose for fasting. He says, when you have a heavy burden, when God's burdened your heart with an injustice that you see, when you're compelled, another purpose for fasting, when you're compelled to give to someone, when you're compelled to assist and to help someone. In verse 8, he gives us another purpose for fasting. He says, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear and then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. This purpose he gives is when we need encouragement. And then in verse 9, he says, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and you will say, here I am. If you do away with this yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk. In verse 9, he says, I will answer your prayer. One of the purposes for fasting is, is for God to hear our prayer and to answer our prayer. In verse 10, he gives us another purpose and he says, and if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, when your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noon day, he says, if you need a revelation. In verse 11, it says the Lord will be your guide. Another purpose of fasting is if we, we need direction. In verse 11, the second part of it, and to strengthen your frame and, and to be a well-watered garden when we need restoration, it says. And then in verse 12, he even says, then your people will be rebuilt. They will be raised up. And another purpose of fasting is when we need to be revived. Then I think the greatest purpose of fasting is when we just need to, to really pursue Christ, when we need to just dive into him, to be with him, to spend more time with him. And you take time out and, and instead of meal prepping and eating, you're, you're seeking God in this time. Instead of being consumed with, with um, you know, uh, with hunger and, or when your hunger pains come and you're consumed with the thoughts of food, now you're, you're turning those thoughts towards the Lord in pursuit of him. And, and you know, I've been guilty at times of thinking that the reason for fasting is, is really when we have some huge event or some just really big thing going on, then we need to fast. You know, if you're looking for a healing or if you're looking for a, a breakthrough or you have a really big decision that you, you have to make, that that is the time for fasting. But I think one of the, the biggest events and one of the biggest things is just a new pursuit of Christ, to experience God like we never have before. That is a reason for fasting, a purpose for fasting. And so we're called to practice fasting. We're called to practice fasting with a purpose. And then the last truth that we'll look at is that, that fasting should be done prayerfully. Almost every time you see fasting in the Bible, it is associated with prayer. When you look at the Old Testament in so many passages, you see in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 23, it says, and so we fasted and we pleaded to God and he was receptive to our prayer. In Nehemiah, you see um, him burdened with the state that Jerusalem laid in. He's burdened with that and he pursues Christ um, with prayer and fasting. Daniel, he's calling out for mercy for the people. And it says he prayed and he fasted. And then in the New Testament, you see that same example from John the Baptist. You see the same example from Jesus, from the disciples. I know in Acts chapter 13, verse 3, it says they prayed and fasted. They laid hands on people. And so these two go together. Every time you see fasting, you see prayer. Matter of fact, I would say that if your fasting doesn't include prayer, it's probably just a really bad diet. And so we need to pray 
and we need to, or we need to fast and pray. In the Gospels, Mark chapter 8, and then again in uh, Matthew chapter 17, there's a father that brings his son to the disciples, and his son is actually possessed by a demon, and it was causing great harm to this son. And, and he brings him to the disciples, and they try, but they're unable to cast out this demon. And, and then later Jesus comes, and he casts this demon out of this boy, and he's restored. And so the disciples ask Jesus, they say, why were we not able to do what you've done? Because in Mark chapter um, six, I think it is, the disciples are actually given the authority to perform miracles and to cast out demons, but yet they're not able to do it in, in this situation. And, and so they say, why could we not do it? And you did it. And, and Jesus responds to them and says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. And so I've, I've often read that scripture and thought that Jesus must have been fasting and prepared in his heart and prepared in his life and in his faith to perform that thing. But this week, I just kind of went back through the stories and I looked at um, the passages before and got context. And, and it's, in the, the trans, it's in that passage where we see the transfiguration. And Jesus is alone with three of his disciples. And, and in that time, there's no mention of him fasting. And it, it doesn't look like he comes on the scene uh, and he's just recently fasted and that's why he's able to do this. But I think what's happening there is that Jesus has made fasting and prayer such a part of his life that he's just been built up in such a way in his faith that when this time came, he was prepared. And so if we're going to combat a great foe, we need to have great faith. And that great faith is built in our life by both prayer and fasting. I've had struggles, I know, in my own life where it didn't seem like with, uh, with all the prayer that I, I, I gave, and that is, it didn't seem that it, it worked. I've met with people who are struggling with a, a sin. I mean, it's such a, a habit in their life, and they can't seem to break through. And I've prayed for them, and they've prayed on their own, and, and a spouse has prayed for them, and their mama's praying for them, and, and everyone's praying, but it doesn't seem that they're able to really break through. And I wonder in those situations if the thing that's missing is fasting. And so I ask you this morning, church, do you need deliverance? Do you, do you have a big decision to make? Do you, do you um, need freedom in an area? Do you need a breakthrough in your life? Do you need an answer to prayer? I want to challenge you to both pray and fast, to practice fasting, to be purposeful in your fasting, and to be prayerful in your fasting. And I'd say this, if you're new to fasting, don't, don't set out on a 40-day on a fast to start. That would be a big mistake. I would say skip a meal, to be intentional and say, today I'm going to not uh, eat lunch, and I'm going to just pray and fast during that time. I'm going to lay down this thing that I need, food, in order to pursue something that I need even greater, and that's you, God. Maybe God is calling you to a, um, a, a fast of material things, and you're going to leave your phone at home for a day, or you're going to uh, stay off of Facebook or something like that, Some, something that's, become a, uh, that's a comfort in your life that maybe even is becoming a necessity. And I want to challenge you to commit to it, be faithful to it, that this spiritual discipline of fasting can have incredible value in your life. And so lay aside something that you need in order to pursue something of greater need, and that's God. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you for this time. And God, thank you for your word that is so 
uh, rich and so practical to our lives today. God, may we never dismiss things that we see in here and say that it's not for us today. God, we can just gain so much when we see your word and we hear your word and we obey your word. And God, I just pray for us in this area of fasting, this laying down something that we need, Lord, this thing that, that our body longs for, Lord, in order to pursue you, God. May we have a longing for more of you, to experience you in a greater way. And so, Lord, I pray for that person this week that's going to make this commitment to this spiritual discipline. Give them strength, Lord. Sustain them. And God, I pray that they may experience you in an all-new way, God. We love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Hey, guys, would you take just a few minutes if you're by yourself or if you're in a group and look at these questions here and then and, and answer them and then try to apply these things to your life. I think that God's got some great things in store for you this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen.